Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Xiao Zhang. And in this video, I'm going to introduce our uh, work published in the web conference 2022, whose title is Unsupervised Graph Poisoning Attack via Contrastive Law Stack Propagation. Okay, so in this paper, our main contribution is as follows. So we propose Contrastive Law's Gradient Attack, which is a gradient-based unsupervised attack method targeting at graph constructive learning. So unlike most supervised attack models, our CLGA does not rely on labels and can degrade the quality of the learning embeddings and thus affect the performance of various downstream tasks. Okay, so here are the contents of this uh, presentation. So I will first introduce some preliminaries, including graph representation models and graph adversarial attacks. Next, I will introduce the motivations and the contributions of our work. <clears throat> At last, I will show our proposed method and the experiment results. Okay, first, let me introduce some preliminaries. Uh, nowadays, graph representation models are widely used in graph learning tasks. They are models that uh, take graphs as input and then output the corresponding embeddings. So for example, in this picture, we have a graph and the associated node features. So it's a JSIS matrix A and the feature matrix X are the input to the encoder, which is a graph representation model. And this model outputs the embedding of each node. So those embeddings are, are then used for various downstream tasks, such as node classification and ink prediction. Uh, typical graph representation models include uh, node web, matrix factorization, and graph neural networks, and so on. Okay, so graph representation models can be divided into two categories. One is supervised models or semi-supervised models, and another is unsupervised models. So supervised models require labels as an input. So whereas unsupervised models do not need labels. Uh, supervised models usually have a better performance than unsupervised models because of the extra information contained in labels. However, in recent years, people have uh, like proposed graph contrastive learning, and it has become the state of the art unsupervised graph representation model and has even shown competitive performance with supervised models. Okay, so what is graph contrastive learning? Uh, well, the core idea is to contrast different views of the original graph. For example, here we have a clean graph with the JCC matrix A and feature matrix X. So the first step of graph contrastive learning is to generate two different views of the original graph using some uh, some stochastic augmentations, T1 and T2. Uh, the most common augmentations are like uh, adding or dropping some edges, or like masking some features. Okay, then the two views, the JCC matrix and the feature matrix A1, X1, A2, X2, are then fed into a shared decoder, an encoder. For example, graph neural network, and it outputs the embeddings of each node. Then these embeddings are used to uh, to compute the contrastive loss. So by minimizing this loss, the parameters of the encoder is updated. When the learning process is finished, the encoder is used to uh, generate embeddings of the original graph. And those embeddings are used for downstream tasks. Okay, so compared with conventional graph representation models, Graph contrasting learning is more robust to the rest of attacks because of the stochastic augmentations, T1 and T2. So before going deeper into this, I will first briefly introduce the robustness and the graph of the rest of attacks. Okay, so the, the robustness of various machine learning models is a quite hot topic in the research community. Uh, for graphs, a uh, small perturbation in the graph structure or the features might change the uh, predictions of the model. So for example, in this graph, we have two classes of nodes, the blue ones and the red ones. So if we delete this edge, if we delete this edge, then this node will be classified as a red node with a very high probability. 
So for graph representation models, the learning embeddings might be largely perturbed, and thus influence the performance of the downstream tasks. Uh, therefore, how to decide a model that is robust to such perturbations is an uh, important research direction. There are two main research streams in this direction. One is to decide effective adversary attacks, and another is to defend against these attacks. So in this work, we only focus on attacks. Okay, so this picture shows the basic framework of uh, graph adversary attacks. This is uh, this is our original. You know, graph and this is a adversary attack model and this model takes a clean graph as input and then generates a poison graph that is uh, slightly different from the neural graph by using this poison graph uh, the target model will have a degraded performance so for example some nodes might be misclassified and and the link prediction result also might be affected uh, mostly these thing a uh, graph adversary attacks are supervised attacks, which means that they need the labels to help decide how to poison the graph, like which edge to delete to drop. Okay, so that's all for the preliminaries and background knowledge. So recall that I have mentioned before that the graph contrasted learning is the state-of-the-art unsupervised graph representation model and is more robust to the rest of attacks compared with conventional models. However, in existing literature, when evaluating the robustness of graph contrast learning, people uh, usually use supervised adversary attacks. But as we know, uh, graph contrast learning itself is a type of unsupervised model. So unsupervised models do not use labels because labels are not always available in real world uh, in real world scenarios. So if we are uh, going to attack graph contrast learning. It's better to assume that uh, we don't have access to the uh, to the labels. So in other words, the attack should also be unsupervised. Okay, uh, recall that uh, existing graph adversary attacks are, are mostly uh, supervised attacks. So we fill this gap and propose a novel unsupervised attack for graph contrasting learning. Uh, here are contributions of this paper. So first, as, we, as I said at the start of this video, uh, we propose contrast loss gradient attack, which is a gradient-based unsupervised attack method targeting at graph contrast learning. So this attack does not rely on labels and can degrade the quality of the learning embeddings and influence the performance of the downstream tasks. Okay. Second, we show uh, by extensive experiments that CLJ outperforms unsupervised attack baselines and has comparable performance with some of the supervised attack methods on three benchmark datasets and on both node classification and leak prediction tasks. Okay, third, we also show that CLJ can be transferred to other graph extension models such as GCN and DeepWalk. At last, we visualize the learning embeddings to show how CLJ influ influences the quality of them. Okay. So the idea of CLJ is simple. This picture again is a flow. Uh, is, 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 a, is a picture of uh, graph contrast learning. As we know, uh, the encoder is learned by minimizing the contrastive loss. So if we want to attack contrastive learning, one possible way is to increase the contrastive loss. If we can somehow locate the most important or informative edges and flip them. Then the encoder will learn a suboptimal solution, and the performance will be degraded. So we achieve this by backpropagating the contrastive loss to the JCC matrices of the two views. After we have the gradients of the JCC matrix, matrix we can uh, tell which edge is the most informative. So typically, the edge which has the largest absolute value is the most important or informative edge with respect to the loss. So if we flip, if we flip such edges, the model will be very likely to be poisoned and then learn a biased solution. So in our method, the back propagation stops at the two views. 
That means we don't pack we don't pack propagate through the stochastic augmentation T1 and T2 because they are not always differentiable. So for example, adding or dropping some nodes or extracting subgraphs. So we only use the gradients of the two views to help locate the most informative edges. Okay. Uh, however, we can't directly use the gradients of the two views to select uh, the edges we want to flip because the two views are different from the original graph. So in other words, the edges which have the largest gradients in the two views might not be the truly important edges. Uh, because the stochastic augmentations T1 and T2 may cause some edges to have a very large gradient. Okay, so to this end, we alleviate this issue. To, alle to, to alleviate this issue, we uh, propose to use two little tricks as shown in the two equations here. Okay, first we end up the two gradient matrices of the two views. In this way, the edges that are heavily influenced by the stochastic augmentations will have a small absolute gradient value and will rank at the lower position. So they are not likely to be flipped by RCLJ. Okay, so why? Uh, well, this is quite related to the property of constructive laws. So what constructive laws is doing is to alleviate the gap between the two views, right? So by minimizing the constructive laws, the encoder will converge to a point where it becomes uh, insensitive to the differences of the two views. So that means even if there are some differences in the two views, like some different edges or different features, the encoder will still try to output similar embeddings for the two views. Okay, now uh, we are looking at the gradients of the JCC matrix. So imagine that the two views are only different at one edge. So that edge exists in the first view, but does not exist in the second view. Then how will the gradients of the edge be like? So apparently its gradient in the first view will be negative and in the second view it will be positive because the constructive loss is trying to elevate a difference between the two views, right? So then by adding them up, we will get a smaller absolute value. So in this way, such edges which are heavily influenced by the stochastic augmentations will rank at a lower position. <coughs> oh, so, so this is why we apply the first trick here. Okay. To further avoid some special cases or some coincidence, we repeat all the procedures for k times here as shown in the second equation, and then add up the delta zeros to obtain a final gradient matrix delta prime. Then we flip the edges with the largest absolute gradient and the correct gradient direction in delta prime so that the constructive loss will increase. So in our experiment, we only flip one single edge in each iteration. Uh, in, each, uh, in each iteration, we retrain the encoder using the poisoned JCC matrix obtained in the pre uh, previous iteration. We stop after a certain number of edges are flipped. Okay, here are some uh, experiment results. Uh, so due to a time limit, I won't go into details of the experiment results. So the conclusion is actually uh, uh, RCLJ can outperform the unsupervised baseline. And we also have a compar competitive comparable performance with the supervised attack methods, such as meta attack, PGD, Mimax, and DICE. Okay. And here we also have uh, the, the experiments for transferability. Uh, we test the transferability of RCLJ on both the deep walk and GCN and find that uh, RCLJ still uh, has a very good uh, transferability compared to meta attack as the unsupervised baseline we choose. Okay, more details please refer to our paper. And here we also have an experiment for yeah, we visualize. 
visualize the learning embeddings using the clean graph and the poison graph by the unsupervised baseline, the meta attack, and CUGA. So we can see that uh, meta attack and CUGA they don't con they, they don't converge very well, especially in the center. So we can see that in the center, the density of the embeddings is much larger than uh, than the two the clean graph and the unsupervised baseline. So this suggests that a lot of load embeddings are being pushed to a, a tricky position where they are like hard to be well classified as any of the classes because they have a quite similar distance to most of the clusters. So in this way, the quality of the neural embeddings is being effectively degraded. Okay, that's all for the introduction of our work. Thanks for listening. Thank you.